My name is Mfoni. My name is Mfoni Suantia. I work with Health of Mother Aid Foundation. And I am currently joining from Kotakot, like Nimo said, from the belly of Pondition. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. And you know. Kindly please turn off your audio until you are ready to speak so that we can all hear ourselves. And if your internet allows, you can also turn on your video so that we can see ourselves and feel more closely knitted together and feel more like we are um, in the physical meeting, but we know we are not anyway. So um, welcome to the conversations. This is um, the first session of these conversations for 2021. Our conversations is a part of our learning spaces. Um, we have an umbrella name for our learning spaces, which is Ikike. Ikike is um, we took it together from uh, two languages in Nigeria, African languages. It means um, strengthening power, it means knowledge, it means um, um, thinking ability, more faculty. So we needed something uh, that can, uh, one name, one African name that can cover up, that can project what our learning space is uh, it's all about. So after many years of searching, we settled for an Kike. Kike is from Ibibio, Kike is from Ibu also. Uh, it means strength. And we all know that knowledge is strength. It means um, power, knowledge brings power too. If you're more knowledgeable than the other person, you have more power than the other person. Well, we hope that you don't abuse the power when you have anyway. So um, we created conversations uh, as part of the learning spaces. Conversations it, uh, was created to, for us, an avenue for us to be able, for us and young activists to be able to learn from past and, um, mainly past um, activists, um, those who have uh, had, um, made tremendous impact in our environment space, in human rights space, that we can learn from them, from uh, their past mistakes, from their experiences, from what they did that was better, that can improve um, our present struggles and our present campaign as activists, as young um, environmental scientists, as activists, as researchers. So that's why Conversations was created. So um, we usually pick um, a known activist or a past activist that, and then we, we, we deliberate, we talk, we converse about the experiences in their lives, what they did right, and where we can improve on. We, we started with Ken Sarawiwa in 2000 and 2008, 2019, and that was a physical meeting, and it was a very unique one because we had a seat for Ken Sarawiwa and Nemo Basi led the conversations. From there, we progressed to other activists. We've also recently improved on the conversations to include topics, um, trending topics, topics of interest, so that we will not just end up talking about um, the past and past activists alone. We can also talk about um, topics that are interesting, topics that are trending, to topics that relate to what we do as human rights activists, as environmental activists also. So for the topics so far, we've spoken about, um, we've spoken about, um, Sorry, skip my mind right now. We've spoken about biosafety, yes. We've spoken about biosafety. We had dialogue on nature, and now we are going to have um, a conversations on eco side. So please join me as I make welcome um, Nimo Basi to introduce the topic and introduce the speaker, and we go right on. Also, remember that you can use the chat box to drop your questions, to take note of, of the questions, and then we can ask. Maybe also that if you really need to speak when it is time for the questions, you can use the the hand sign so we can know that you want to speak and we can we can um, we can give you the chance to unmute and ask your questions directly like we said you are uh, you're free to turn on your video if you have a good internet welcome once again from portacot nigeria thank you so much Mponiso, um and thank you jojo meta for making time to be with us today <laughs> on this very important issue that you've devoted the last uh, years of, I mean, some years now to, to work on continuously. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all participants who have joined us from diverse locations. We still had a lot of interest, many people registered, so we believe some would be joining us as we go on. Uh, so uh, my job at this point, before we kick off the conversation, is to introduce 
uh, Jojo Meta. And um, uh, let me thank also all my, I've seen a number of faces I've not seen for a long time. So <laughs> joining from Germany, from Nigeria, from other parts of Africa, you're all welcome. Um, Jojo Meta co-founded co Stop Ecocide in 2017 alongside uh, legal pioneer and barrister, the late Polly Higgins. Uh, and the whole idea is to support the establishment of ecocide as a crime at the International Criminal Court. She's the key spokesperson and executive director of Stop Ecocide International and helps coordinate between legal developments, diplomatic areas, and private people. She has overseen the marked growth of Sopicocide movement that now has teams in 15 countries across six continents. Probably some more will be added as we're speaking. She's chair of the of Sopicocide Foundation and convener of in, the independent expert panel for the legal definition of ecocide. Uh, she has an incredible capacity to connect to grassroots campaign campaigners, international lawyers, politicians, diplomats, you name it. It's a great privilege for us today to have Jojo join this conversation, to lead this conversation, uh, despite her very tight and busy schedule. So thank you so much for joining Home Health Conversations today to discuss ecocide, a key potential uh, solution to addressing the climate and ecological crisis, as well as other harms uh, that are being inflicted on Mother Earth by various actors. So Jojo Meta, welcome. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here <laughs> and to see so many new faces. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. So we are going to kick off right away. Um, the first question I have for you, just to kick off conversation, is not strictly a question and answer kind of uh, conversation, but just a discussion we're going to be discussing. Uh, but there are many issues that we want some information on, which will help us and as well as other participants. Ecocide has rapidly become a frequently used term in newspapers, on television, but there are a lot of people who are still not very clear about what ecocide means. Can you help us unpack this terminology and concept? Absolutely. So I think when ecocide is used in general terms, it's, there is a broad understanding now that it simply means kind of mass damage or serious level damage and destruction to nature or to ecosystems. So as a sort of loose definition, that is how most people kind of understand it. And we use a working definition at, at Stop Ecocide of mass damage and destruction of ecosystems that is, is widespread or severe or systematic and is committed with knowledge of the risks because you know we believe that in this day and age it is almost impossible for those who are making decisions which lead to serious destruction of nature it is almost impossible for them to be able to say i didn't know what the result might be of my action and so we feel that that it, it is appropriate to say that it's actions taken, understanding what risks there are, but taking them anyway. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for that very crisp definition. And it did agree with you that uh, with all our concerns about environmental issues, it's very, uh, it's unbelievable if, if anybody should say uh, he took or, or ordered an action uh, that has massive impact on the environment without knowing. You say, oh, I didn't know this is what I was doing. Uh, it just doesn't make sense at all. Uh, and so this is, what well, this has been on, this kind of situation has been on for a very long time. Uh, when the Rome Statute was being developed and, and became something that binds a hun about 123 countries so far, how come ecocide was not on the table? Well, that's an interesting story because there was at the time of the drafting of the code which became the Rome Statute or the governing document of the International Criminal Court. At the time of drafting, there was a clause 
which would have covered serious environmental destruction. And at the time it was it was clause 26 and that's how it was referred to. Um, but that clause was dropped before the statute um, was agreed upon. And it was dropped without a vote. Um, it was supposedly at the sort of unilateral decision of the, 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 the man in charge of the, of the drafting. Um, and we've never found exactly where that where when that decision was made but what we have found it, in, in research around this is that there were certain countries which specifically objected to that clause being in the document and those countries were the US, the UK, the Netherlands, France and on one occasion also Brazil. Now it's very interesting that those countries are oil are all oil countries, they're all oil states in their, in their way. Um, and, and the other connecting factor at that time, and not so much perhaps with Brazil, but with the others, was that there was um, investigation and development around nuclear testing in the 1990s when this was being discussed. And it is thought that that might also have been a, a consideration in them not wanting this clause to end up in international law as, a, as, a, as an international crime. Um, and as one can imagine, I mean, it's difficult to imagine a, a nuclear weapon or even a nuclear weapons test not being ecocidal. And so, you know, that may well have been one of the key factors. And it's interesting in the historical sense um, of, of this movement in that Polly Higgins, who is largely viewed as the pioneer and kind of the the inspiring figure behind this uh, more recent gathering movement to make ecocide a crime. What's interesting historically in that is that when she started researching around the possibility of, of criminalizing ecosystem destruction and found out about this, um, this clause that never made it, it had a very strong influence on how she took this forward because the way that she saw it, she was effectively wanting to replace a missing crime that should have been there in the first place. And if we look back and think about how the last 20 years might have looked if that crime had made it to the statute 20 years ago, we could be looking at a very different situation now. So there is a strong feeling in this movement that this is a missing crime that is finally, we hope, being put in place. Mm. Um, you know, when you mentioned the fact that uh, you have to do some forensic work to find out why ecocide was dropped off the table when the Rome Statute was being developed, that is very significant. And the fact that countries like the US, the UK, Netherlands, Brazil uh, were among those who openly rejected the notion of having ecocide, that is also very instructive. But as you mentioned, the nuclear testing, nuclear testing, especially in the Pacific. Uh, region. The, the impact of those nuclear testings are, are still uh, still being felt today. And to, to have knowingly uh, used territories uh, far away from home to test such deadly weapons showed that there was an intent to externalize the harms to other people. And, uh, and of course, because they had the power to do so. And I think some of these countries, a country like the US, is not really even on board in terms of the international uh, criminal court. Uh, they, they're not subject. subject well, that, that, that's true in the sense that they're not members of the ICC. They did originally sign the statute, but they never ratified it. So they never became full members of the International Criminal Court. And it's often brought up as, you know, is, is this a problem? Because, you know, if it doesn't apply in the US, you know, how, how will that work? But it's interesting because the International Criminal Court um, as a mechanism is unique, it's the only global mechanism which directly accesses the criminal justice systems of all its member states. So if you make something a crime at the ICC, any member state which ratifies it must include it in their own domestic legislation. Now, that, what that means is that the potential influence of it is actually rather broader than just the ICC itself, which is based in The Hague. Um, and of course, there's also the potential advantage of if uh, countries like the US are not members, they also can't vote against this law being created because they're not in that, they're not around that table to do that. And that's not necessarily a disadvantage for us in moving it forward. 
But what, what I think people often don't realize is that um, a, a crime at the ICC, as I say, once uh, the states ratify it, that can be applied in any ratifying jurisdiction. Now, of course, with the existing international crimes, uh, war crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, the crime of aggression, you know, these can often be state level crimes. So a war criminal is unlikely to be held to account in their own state. And so the, there's more of a likelihood that they will end up at the court of last resort, which is what the ICC is meant to be. It was built on a complementarity principle. So if a state is unwilling or unable to prosecute, but with ecocide, you have a different situation because ecocide is by and large a corporate crime. Of course, there are many state sponsored corporations and there are indeed one or two heads of state that one might want to point the finger at with regard to ecocide. But generally speaking, it's a crime of corporate practice. And what that means is that key decision makers could be prosecuted in their, in their own jurisdiction potentially, or indeed in any ratifying jurisdiction. So you could have a situation, I'm just going to pull a hypothetical one out of the air. Um, let's say a, a US company is uh, committing ecocide in, I don't know, Venezuela, for example, um, but it has an operational office in Belgium and Belgium ratifies this crime. And that's not unlikely. Belgium is a front runner uh, already for, for, for this movement. So a Belgian court could prosecute a US perpetrator in Belgium. So what that means is that the scope for the potential of prosecution is rather broader than people often understand and probably broader than it is for some of the other international crimes. Mm, thank you so much. Um, what, one of the things I'm hearing really addresses an issue that we have been trying to understand. So if ecocide becomes a crime at the ICC and a country like Nigeria has already ratified the ICC, uh, that means that um, this law would become part of our domestic law in Nigeria. Uh, the country would it's not quite as straightforward as that, in the sense that Nigeria may have been an original signatory to the statute, which included war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. But any additional crimes must be individually ratified by states. So, um, for example, the crime of aggression, which uh, was finally adopted in 2017, has, I think it's 36 or 38 states which have ratified it, but the other states have not. But what it means is that any state that has ratified it can prosecute that crime. So you, you still, you, you, it, it's not possible for the ICC to override the sovereign state's um, decision on whether or not to ratify a crime. But it does mean that via um, the, the international nature of the crime and via universal jurisdiction principles, um, that crime can be persecuted as it can be prosecuted by any ratifying state. Okay, that means that there's a lot of work still being done even after ecocide has been admitted at the ICC. Good. So so all of us, all of us were interested in having corporations held to account in our territories and our nations. We have to pick this up and also campaign at the local level. Um, that's interesting. Thank you so much. So with so much work that Stop Ecocide Foundation has done, uh, can you just tell us which countries and regions are open to having ecocide? You mentioned Belgium as being a forerunner, uh, recognized as a crime, and how receptive is the United Nations in this regard? Absolutely. So we're, we're now in a position where uh, eight ICC member states have a recorded interest at government level in different ways, in different places, um, and those are Vanuatu and the Maldives, first and foremost, because those were the Pacific Island states that first called at the International Criminal Courts Gen uh, General Assembly, which is called the Assembly of States Parties and happens in December every year. Those two countries called for it at the end of 2019. Um, and they basically brought that conversation back onto the international stage where it had not been really since the early 70s. So that was a hugely important step. But through the course of last year, 2020, uh, France uh, also expressed support. President Macron expressed support particularly for the crime at the ICC to move it forward there. But also France is the first country to be looking at it uh, for a national 
law as well. And we'll perhaps come back to that because there are some interesting issues that have arisen in that context. Um, but also Belgium, which is the first European country to raise the issue specifically again at the International Criminal Court, which they did last year. Also Spain, uh, whose Foreign Affairs Committee has recommended to the government that they examine legislating for ecocide nationally and internationally. Um, Finland, whose foreign minister actually joined an event that we hosted in December um, with a very supportive uh, message around um, the and watching very closely the development of the, the legal definition, which is being worked on at the moment. Um, and then also uh, Canada and Luxembourg have both perhaps not so strongly, but they have both very clearly said, we are watching this, this conversation very closely. And Luxembourg even went a little bit further and said, we will be ready to support when the time is right. And then beyond that, we also have support at the parliamentary level um, from many different countries in terms of the conversation being brought to life at the parliamentary level. Um, and in at least 15 other countries, there is interest in the definition that is currently being evolved, the legal definition that is currently being evolved. And then just last week, and some of you may have heard of it, heard about this, but there were two votes in the European Parliament um, both supporting, very strongly supporting in principle, the criminalization of ecocide. Um, it, one was in a uh, a foreign affairs report um, about human rights and environmental defenders, because as I'm sure you know, environmental defenders have been under increasing threat globally over recent years. Um, and there was a clause in that report which suggested that EU member states should support the development at the International Criminal Court of criminalizing ecocide. The second uh, report was a, was a legal affairs report about the liability of companies for environmental damage. And there was a clause in that report which specifically requested the European Commission to look at, e at EU law and diplomacy with regard to criminalizing ecocide. So these are very strong developments and there's a, there's a, there's a, a very strong momentum happening. And I suppose I shouldn't forget to mention um, His Holiness Pope Francis because He's also, although, although the Vatican isn't a member of the ICC, he's certainly a head of state. And in fact, he was the first, just before Vanuatu and the Maldives, to raise this issue publicly, which he did at the International Association of Penal Law in Rome. And he specifically called for ecocide to be made a fifth crime against peace at the International Criminal Court. So as you can see, the, 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 the level, the, the sort of level of state and political support is rapidly growing at the moment. And one thing that I'd like to mention in that regard is the concept itself has almost its own internal momentum because we all perceive very strongly that serious damage is happening to nature in very various ways in different arenas, whether that's, you know, whether that's uh, the marine environment, whether that's deforestation, whether that's air pollution. Um, and so having a word that brings all of that together as, you know, this is all serious destruction of nature is actually very helpful. It, it, I mean, we often find you know, you, you kind of almost see these, these little light bulbs going on in people's eyes when they kind of grasp the word, because it's like, of course, this is what's happening. And of course, as soon as you understand it, you also have the kind of almost automatic sort of intuitive sense that, well, this is wrong, this needs to be stopped. And so there's, there's something about the concept itself, which is helping to move forward the political traction. Absolutely. Um, uh, one would have to be totally insensitive not to recognize that we are in a state of multiple crises in the world today. Uh, no wonder many of the United Nations Day celebrations are the World Environment Day, the World Oceans Day. Uh, every day is hinged around restoring, restoring, restoring. Uh, and so uh, it, it's a very marked sense, except that when it comes to climate change, the actions uh, the nations are speaking was speaking left and walking right. Everybody is trying to move backwards and not go forward. Uh, so, so having ecocide kick in would be very interesting indeed. Uh, it's interesting to see that countries like Vanuatu and Maldives were the first to openly declare that they, we need this. And one can understand that they are facing exist existential challenges from climate change, sea level rise. And uh, Vanuatu is such a, a slim country in the middle of the Pacific. 
that some high waves could almost cross over the whole country at a time at some places, <laughs> which shows how very dangerous. And they have a problem about where to relocate to. Because even in the face of crisis, some nations that could take the people in are not willing to do so. Uh, well, but you know, you mentioned the case of France, and I, I find France a very interesting country. They've they've stopped the prospecting for fossil fuels in, on their territory, uh, but at the same time, their corporations are all over the place looking for oil and gas, all over the Niger Delta, uh, over the Mozambique and elsewhere, uh, as well as mining for nuclear uh, for uranium in Niger Republic. Uh, so, the, so countries could say we don't want this thing happening, we don't want these harmful activities happening in our territory, but we don't mind having it happen somewhere else. Uh, I would like to under, uh, understand that with ecocide, that kind of position would not, would not allow them to escape liability. I think that's absolutely right. And I think the, the interesting thing, that there's two interesting things around that. One is more specific to France and one is a more general point. Um, so in the case of France, it's very interesting because France is almost becoming a pilot case for, you know, a legislating for ecocide. Um, and what, it, what the process there has shown is that it's quite difficult for states to legislate domestically on their own. They, fi it, it, they find it politically scary. Um, and what's happened in France shows why. Effectively, um, the, the corporate sector um, has, has resisted quite strongly you know, bringing this into French law. And they've ended up kind of watering down the definition so that what the French Citizens Climate Assembly asked for is not really what they're getting at the domestic level. Um, and that shows that there's there's a reluctance sort of on economic and um, sort of, I suppose, you know, yeah, international competition in terms of, you know, who's, who's going to bring their custom to France and so on. All of that, those sort of established economic relationships feel threatened by a law like this, even though in principle, it can be seen clearly that it's needed. So this is actually one of the reasons that we specifically advocate for an international law, because actually, politically speaking, it's much easier for states to express support for an international law because they know that a lot of states need to come on board for it to move forward. So they don't have to act overnight. And actually, that's quite important because you know, we're, we're, of course, in different parts of the world, there is there are different degrees and kinds of suffering as a regard as regards ecocide. That's absolutely uh, unquestioned. At the same time, we are looking at a global level crisis in terms of the environment, in terms of ecological deterioration. This is not a situation. If it ever was, it's certainly not a situation anymore where any country can point over there and say, you know, the leak, that leak, it's at your end of the boat. Okay, you know, we're still going to all sink. So there's a, a way in which bringing this to the international stage and at the international level is also more practical because we do need to all move together. But what that means, because ecocidal activity is so, you know, built in to the global economic system, it, there, there is a certain amount of time needed to transition uh, because, you know, companies and, and governments can't instantly change their, their, their practices overnight. One needs to put in place transition policies and compliance pathways. And that's one of the things that's very important. When you bring in a criminal law, it doesn't act retrospectively. And, you know, although from and you know i came to this from on the ground activism myself from the anti-fracking movement i this is how i came into this work and if you'd asked me a few years ago i would probably have been quite happy to give you a list of ceos that i would like to see in the dock for ecocide i'm not going to do that now and the reason i'm not going to do that now is that what we're ultimately trying to do is change practice so that we actually start protecting the environment. So it, it, it's one thing to take someone to court and extract the punishment and, 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 and compensation, hopefully, and those things. But what we ultimately want is for the practices to change so that that doesn't have to happen. And if we want to take everybody with us on this, which we do, we need to take the whole corporate, corporate world with us on this, then we have to allow a, a sort of transition period, not a long one. We know we don't have long. 
but there has to be some degree of time for adjustment. And what's been interesting over the last year with the situation with the global pandemic is, you know, it's been horrific in many in many countries. Uh, the you know the social and economic impacts of of COVID nineteen. However, there are one or two silver linings, and one of those is precisely this aspect of how fast can governments act, because in the past we were often told it's going to take decades to get something like ecocide law in place. Well, because, you know, it takes a long time to do these things. Well, we now know that that's no longer an excuse. We know that if states need to move fast, they can, because they have over the last year in terms of some of the, the policies and regulations that have been brought in as a result of COVID. So we now obviously want the political world to expand that ability to address also the climate and ecological crisis. And so we think that within three to five years, we could actually get a law of ecocide in place. And then I wanted to come back to the other aspect that you brought up, Nemo, because you were talking about how, you know, the, the sort of wealthier countries might just want to farm out the destruction to other countries. And that actually happens already to a large degree. One of the, the beauties, I believe, of criminalizing ecocide at the international level is that you kind of remove the impunity um, and you prevent what happens, what often happens, which is this kind of jurisdiction hopping where you know where companies will simply sort of move operations to a different country but when you're looking at prosecuting for ecocide you're not actually looking to prosecute the you know where the ecocide is happening necessarily because the key the key decisions behind those projects are actually often made in the wealthy north and so this actually aims at those key decision makers rather than at potentially the sort of smaller subsidiaries that might be the local the local manifestation of that ecocide uh, and that is one of the aspects that you know i find particularly powerful about this concept and about doing it at the international level because it does have that possibility of rebalancing that particular aspect right and uh, you answered many questions I had in my mind in that, <laughs> which is fantastic. Um, and I'm very, really happy to hear you are so optimistic that ecocide could kick in, become a law in two to five years. Uh, that's very interesting. That's a very good uh, estimate. But I, I would just like you, I know uh, you set up Stop Ecocide Foundation, Stop Ecocide International, uh, set up this uh, legal panel to define ecocide the six members of that panel. Could you tell, tell us a bit about why we need a legal, such a legal definition? Uh, why can't we just define it? And as you said at the beginning of this conversation. <laughs> yes, it's, it's actually rather important to have um, a, a, a specifically uh, legal definition um, because ultimately that is what states will want to look at if they're going to get behind this this law and the panel which actually has 12 members they're from all different parts of the world so it's very geographically diverse and it also has a, a mixture of international criminal lawyers and environmental lawyers um, and that's important because the two have not necessarily interlinked so much in the past um, so that group has been working for a few months already and they're due to conclude their drafting process uh, next month in June um, and we're aiming to launch this uh, legal definition publicly with a press conference on the 21st of June that is the the, the plan and what what they're aiming for is specific specifically to craft a definition that can fit into the Rome Statute, in other words, that uses the correct kind of language that fits with the international crimes that are already existing. Um, and that is, it, it's aiming for, I mean, obviously the, the deliberations themselves are confidential, so I can't go into detail, but what the aim is, is ultimately to come up with a definition that I mean, this is the, I'm using my words for this now that that kind of hits a sweet spot, if you like, because it must be serious enough to warrant 
a position as the inter an international crime. Um, and at the same time, not so, with not so high a threshold that it's impossible to prosecute it. So, um, for example, I mean, a good way to explain that might be to, th to think about genocide as an international crime. And the way that it has been phrased, the crime internationally, um, is that you have to show intent by the perpetrator to destroy a people in whole or in part. And that is a very, very high bar. It's very difficult to prove that level of intent. And that is specifically written in to the genocide provision, as opposed to the statute generally, which has its own intent provisions. So um, looking at ecocide, we're aiming to find something that is that is in that in the ballpark of, you know, this is serious environmental destruction, because what we want is we want state representatives to look at that definition and kind of go well of course that should be a crime that's a terrible thing that's got to be a crime and at the same time not put it so high that it's impossible to, to, to chase so you know there, there's there's a no, there are a whole number of considerations there um that, that come into that discussion and it's been a very interesting journey um to sort of witness that that legal toing and froing um to to find the right the right kind of phrasing um and we're you know we're very much looking forward to how that emerges um, and it will also really help because one of the things we get asked most often I mean particularly in, in interestingly in the corporate sector uh, where people are starting to become quite interested in this is well how do I know if I'm committing ecocide <laughs> you know and of course you know that has to be phrased in such a way that a prosecutor or a judge will be able to actually make a call on that interesting um, now it's interesting you mentioned the way a corporate corporate leader could say, "How do I know when I'm committing uh, ecocide?" Um, <laughs> when they know that dumping uh, talks the question and the environment. Uh, they say, "Day I was at a factory in Togo, and uh, this factory was pumping. They pump their waste directly into the ocean. Up to 1.5 kilometers out to sea, you can see the whole ocean there green in color because of the algae bloom and everything." And the fishers are totally out of work. And I asked the manager of the factory, why are you doing this? And he said, you have to break the omelet to you have to break the egg to make the omelet. In other words, this is inevitable. And this kind of notion is uh, really something that I believe ecocide uh, crime uh, would help, would give them an incentive to understand and pretend and stop pretending they don't know what they're doing because they know what they're doing. Uh, in this, in uh, with this premise, I, I would like you to address the concern of some people that if ECOSA, when ECOSAD becomes a crime, uh, some businesses will move from certain countries where they would consider that it, their business is no longer competitive. In other words, if they're going to be held liable, they'll move to areas where they will not be held liable. Do you think that ECOSAD would uh, kind of uh, uh, dampen the business in some countries? Um, yes, I mean, I, I, I think I think that's that's an interesting point and, and speaks is linked to the, to what we were just talking about, um, in the sense that yes, I can imagine companies wanting to change country if they want to continue um, sort of polluting operations, but then there there is, as I say, there is still the possibility of being able to kind of clock if you like and log that activity, and for countries which have ratified that crime to potentially arrest and prosecute actors who are doing that. I mean, they would need to, to do it on the, the territory of the ratifying country, but it does make, it does mean that it's not quite as easy to disappear from liability um, as it currently is. At the moment, that practice is quite common and we believe it will be notably reduced by a, a crime of ecocide. Um, and I think to come back to the corporate side is quite interesting because um, those corporations who are which are trying to move in the right direction um, and it's sort of in the corporate sustainability world for example um, you know they're really crying out for a rule like this because at the moment there is no kind of safety rail you know to prevent the the, the companies that want to operate in a less 
beneficial way. And it means that what those, you know, what the companies, the polluting companies are then doing is effectively externalizing real costs. So, I mean, just to give a very small example that we encounter here in, in the UK, for example, you know, if I go to the supermarket, I'm going to be spending twice the amount of money to buy healthier food. So in other words, it's more expensive to buy, say, organically farmed food, which is much healthier for the environment, for the food, for the people who eat it. It's more expensive. But the cheaper food actually costs more. It's just the costs are not being given to me. The costs are being given to what, you know, to, to the to the 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 places where the soil is suffering where the insect life is being destroyed where the health effects of the pesticides are being felt all of that cost has been externalized and so what we're ultimately aiming to do is to rebalance that as well you know so that um the you know if if the level of destruction is no longer permitted then those costs have to be taken into account and i think the other thing that's important here about criminalizing at the top level is really about a kind of cultural, a shift in the cultural mindset. Because although there are environmental laws all around the world, they're often poorly enforced um, and they often, the, the, the results, so I think, I think there might need, there might need to be something needs to move there. <laughs> Uh, uh, please, please. Uh, the host can, can the host just meet all of everybody yeah yeah, I think yeah. So. yeah sorry about that um uh, no it's okay <laughs> so yeah so just just to continue that point um there's there's the potential for a major shift in the cultural mindset because although there are many environmental laws worldwide they're often poorly enforced and they often end up simply with uh you know a slap on the wrist and a fine and of course you know to a big company that's no kind of deterrent um because it, you know they just budget for that um but what it shows on a more deeper level is that, and particularly in the wealthy North, that we have become so separated from our connection to nature. We, you know, we almost, you know, I think our, our kind of whole economic structure is really based on this separation. It's based on the idea that somehow, you know, humans have the right to, you know, treat nature just as a, a, a resource to extract from. And People have lost touch with the fact that, you know, we, we couldn't eat, drink, breathe, any of the things we do without the healthy ecosystems. And, and so by criminalizing ecocide at the highest level, that's sending a very, very strong moral message because we do use criminal law. In, in, in this kind of dominant Western paradigm that, that, that it exists at the moment in the world, we use criminal law to draw the moral lines. So, you know, you can't go to a government and say, oh, can I have a permit to kill a few hundred people? It'll be really good for jobs because my business is great. No, you can't do that because it's criminal and it's totally morally unacceptable. But you can go to a government and ask for a permit for fracking or for deep sea fishing that's going to trash the whole swathes of the seabed. You know, you don't even need a permit to use certain pesticides, you know, all of these things. And what that shows is that we simply don't take damage to nature as seriously as we take damage to property or damage to people. Um, and so by, by criminalizing destruction of nature at the highest level, what you're saying is, you, you know, it, it's a real concentration of the mind that you're creating because people are then having to think well hang on a minute if this is a really bad thing to do then maybe you know we have to take other aspects into consideration and we have to take existing environmental law more seriously and i think that this will actually be i mean obviously on one level it's a it's a stick you know it's a deterrent but on another level it's also a carrot it's also an empowering thing because what that means is that all of those, and, and I'm sure that includes this whole, all of this audience, the, the activists, the NGOs, the academics, the experts, the scientists, all the people who are working towards a better relationship with nature, a more responsible relationship, and looking at the actual effects of you know, extractive activity and pushing for new legislation, all of that will be empowered because it will be taken more seriously. And so there, there is a kind of a very kind of deep fundamental shift that this law could represent. We don't believe it will fix everything. I mean, you know, murder has been a crime for centuries, but people still get killed. However, just imagine what it would be like if murder was not a crime. 
you know, it, effectively what we're doing here is shifting the whole normative, the whole way that people perceive damage to nature and putting it below that moral red line. And I believe that, you know, long term, that may prove to be the most important aspect of what we're doing. Thank you so much, Jojo. And um, let me just, uh, as uh, participants, you can put in your questions or comments in the chat box. We have in 10 minutes, I'm going to be shutting up and then Jojo will take your questions and answers. Uh, now, Jojo, um, about change, changing the narrative, the shifting the cultural mindset, uh, it reminds me of something I've read that I believe you've said um, about the fact that um, the current legal system generally is about had origins was in protecting property. And this is why, I think this is why really people feel more, uh, they're ready to respond to damage done to property rather than damage done to nature. Uh, now, you, I, I would like to hear a comment on that, but essentially I want you to see, help us situate ecocide in the context of the proposal for universal declaration of the rights of Mother Earth, which was drawn up in Cochabamba, Bolivia in April 2020, 2010. Yeah, I think I think this is really interesting because what that declaration shows is very much what we were just talking about, which is this very kind of um, sort of deeply felt shift in how we relate to nature, treating Mother Earth as a living being, as a, a, a sort of living system in which we are part rather than, uh, you know, a kind of, you know, bank of resources that we can extract from. And I think that that, that declaration is was absolutely key in terms of uh, reframing all of that. Um, and of course, as you as you're probably aware, I mean, there's there's now, you know, a very broad rights of nature movement around the world um, where and in fact, there, you know, there've been a number of um, instances of different parts of the world where particular landscape features, for example, have been given legal status of their own, like the Whanganui River in, in New Zealand, um, certain parts of the forest in Colombia, rivers in India and Bangladesh and so on. Um, but the relationship of, of that narrative to the ecocide law narrative is a little bit like the relationship between human rights and criminal law as it is. So if, if you imagine, I mean, you know, our basic right is the right to life. And indeed, the basic right in the Universal Declaration of Mother Earth is, is the right to life of, of the earth, if you like, to exist. So our basic right is the right to, to life and to exist. But what protects that right is the fact that murder is a crime. So effectively, the criminal law aspect is the protective aspect. So my life is protected and my right to life is protected because it's a crime to kill me. And so ecocide effectively has, ecocide law has the same kind of relationship with that declaration of rights. It helps to protect those rights because, you know, e even when those rights are in place, if there is, if there is no consequence to infringing on those rights, then you know it's it's hard for those rights to be fully upheld and it's an interesting situation to compare the human rights situation with environmental rights and with the environmental camp environmental movement generally because you know at least if you're campaigning for human rights or social justice or um you know you kind of know that there are some basic laws that are in that, that are a foundation for what you're doing you know that killing people is wrong torturing people is wrong you know all of these things genocide is you know, all of these things are illegal but it, in terms of a really foundational law that does the same thing for the environmental um, activists and, and those working for the health of mother earth that foundational piece isn't there yet. And that is what we believe ecocide law can, can create, is that kind of foundational piece. But I would say as well that the ecocide law um, sort of initiative, if you like, has a very specific relationship to certain clauses in the Universal Declaration of Mother Earth Rights. So, uh, of the rights of Mother Earth. So particularly um, Article 3, um, Clause E, which says, um, talks about establishing and applying effective norms and laws for the defense, protection and conservation of the rights of Mother Earth. And that's exactly where we would put ecocide in that category. And also it says to establish precautionary, this is, this is our Article 3i, to establish precautionary and restrictive measures to prevent human activities from causing species extinction, destruction of ecosystems, or disruption of ecological cycles. And again, that, that's very close 
to what we believe ecocide law can achieve. And I think what's interesting as well is that um, you're probably familiar with the, the leader's pledge for nature, which was, um, I think it was actually initiated in the UK, but it's now been signed by 84 states. Um, and that was, that was, um, that came into existence, I think, last September. And there's a clause in that which has been effectively signed by 84 countries now, which says we commit to ending environmental crimes, which can seriously impact efforts to tackle environmental degradation, biodiversity loss and climate change, and can undermine security, the rule of law, human rights, public health, and social and economic development. We will ensure effective, proportionate, and dissuasive legal frameworks and strengthen national and international law enforcement and foster effective cooperation operation. So at least in words, many countries have already sort of voiced that something more is needed in the in the legal sphere. Now, obviously, it remains to be seen in practice, uh, in relation to what you said earlier about speaking to the left and moving to the right, you know, <laughs> whether countries will actually be able to put their money where their mouth is, um, and, and move forward with this. But what is really interesting in that context, and I think very empowering, and I, and I hope this is something that, that um, you can all take to heart, um, which is that, and it's kind of a, a, there's a little story behind it in, in a way, when Polly Higgins and I first started this campaign, this public facing campaign, we thought we were doing two things. One, we were creating a document that could be used by uh, environmental defenders if they ended up in court and that is something that has been used over the years it was a kind of almost a a side bonus for, for for the for the campaign but principally we were recruiting the support of a grassroots following that Polly already had in order to crowdfund the diplomatic work because um you know, traditional funding foundations found it quite extreme or risky to back what we were doing. And but we knew that at the level of asking the people, we had the support. So it, it was originally intended to, you know, effectively to crowdfund the, the work that was going on at the diplomatic level at the time with the Pacific Island states. Now, what we found over time is that it's far more important than that. Because actually where we have communication teams on the ground, which we have in 15 countries now, we also see that the political dial is pushed faster. So the, the relationship of an on the ground campaign to the results of what we're doing is actually much closer than we originally anticipated. The public pressure aspect and even just the conversational aspect of people talking about ecocide. You remember what I was saying about the, um, the internal momentum of this concept, where that is happening on the ground. So where that is happening in individual countries, in their culture and in their language, where this is, where this is being spoken about, we're also seeing that there's a difference at the political level and parliamentarians are then getting in touch with us and saying, what's this ecocide thing? Can you tell us about it? So we know that actually, that, that we, we actually found that very empowering when we realized that, um, because it, it actually makes a huge difference. You know, every single person in this Zoom meeting will have a network, you know, it may be a small network, it may be a large network. But what we know is that if you talk about ecocide in your networks, it very consciously and very obviously makes a difference to the conversation at the political level. And that's something that's really evolved over the last couple of years and has been hugely supported by climate mobilization on the ground. For example, you know, Extinction Rebellion, uh, Greta Thunberg, school strikes, um, the, it, the, the strikes inspired by Greta, uh, but also, you know, the word actually, interestingly, on the African continent has been alive for rather longer. I mean, with the Stop the Mangamizi, we charge genocide ecocide campaign, you know, there, there are many on the ground mobilizations that are also really starting to shift this and open the, open the um, what's the word? Uh, I think they call it the Overton window. So the, 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 the window of accepted conversation within the media and politics has now expanded to really include the climate and ecological crisis. And that creates a space for this concept and this law to actually land and for people to hear it. Thank you very much. This will not be our last time to have this kind of conversation. 
Uh, but uh, <laughs> I, I know we could go on for another one hour, but we have a time <laughs> budget, and I know you are quite busy also. We're, we're so glad to be to have you speak to us today. And I just want to let you know that Health of Mother Foundation, of course, from our name, you know how concerned we are about this matter. Uh, we now we have a death consciously focusing on the rise of Mother Earth as well as on ecocide. So, so this is on the this is fully on the table. Uh, but before I hand over to, yes, before I hand over to Mfoni, so I would like you to just tell us um, what in your opinion can individuals and concerned organizations uh, do to help this struggle to have ecocide uh, recognized as a law, as a crime? As a law. crime, yeah, absolutely. So, um, there, I mean, there are various ways that you can support as an individual and as an organization support our foundation and our campaign if you go to stop ecocide.earth um, you, you will be able to find some of those actions that can be taken endorsements and writing to people and so on but I would come back again and again to the key aspect which is talk about it talk about it, talk about it in every possible circumstance and in all your possible networks because the more different locations and different sectors and different walks of life where people are discussing this concept the harder it is for those who are supposed to represent us to avoid it and we don't want them to be able to do that what we are aiming to do over the next year or two is create a political space where governments will simply be too embarrassed to say they don't want to talk about this and that is what we need to move this forward. Thank you so much. And now I turn it over to Mfoni, so. Thank you so much, Jojo. Um, so uh, we have a, a couple of questions here out. Uh, maybe, would you mind me reading all of them or one after the other? Uh, as, okay, as you okay. wish. Okay, maybe one after the other, let's see. So someone, Philip is asking um, for communities that want to hold corporations liable for ecocide. What is the starting point? Because relying on your definition, how would they establish the tag that that targeted corporations knew the risk? So the, 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 there's a couple of things there. The first one is that this is not like suing a company. If, if you make something a crime, I mean, let's say you you know I don't know you're walking down the street and somebody shoots you, uh, and you're you know you're incapacitated in some way but you're still around and you don't personally sue that person you go to the police and the state prosecutes so it's a different procedure so in this case if a community was wanting to hold a company liable for ecocide they would report it to the author to the prosecuting authority which if their state has ratified that crime it would be their state and it would then be on the burden of the state to um to show that that's what had happened um the in terms of um how would they establish that the targeted corporations knew the risk in this day and age most of the information that they need is already in the public domain so the kinds, you know, both the historical damage that has happened from certain activities, the reports that have been submitted, including, you know, many UN reports um, and so on. So the, the information is much more readily available than it might have been even 10 years ago. So, so those, are the, those are sort of two aspects of that. I think that has hands out. I think um, there are two questions almost similar. Someone is asking, Al um, Maruf is asking, um, we know with ICC, individuals do not initiate legal prosecution. The eco side who initiates the prosecution, communities or their governments. And someone asked a follow-up question, said, can individual take legal action for eco side or should it be a community or government? That's about the same thing. It's actually, it is possible for individuals to file at the ICC. And um, there, th there are different ways of filing at the ICC. So it can, uh, an individual can file, but also, um, I mean, a, a country could also file, but and, and, and also a, U, a UN Security Council member can also file, even if, and in fact, that's one way of getting um, an ecocide case looked at at the ICC by a member state, sorry, by a state that isn't a member, if you sort of mean. Um, so there are various different ways that can be, that can be used and an individual can make a filing. Um, but, but yes, a community could also, could also do that. Um, yeah. And effectively, the same things would apply as would normally apply for 
press it, reporting a crime and pressing charges if, if, if you're doing it within the national context. Okay, so um, Emeyak is concerned about um, the fact that Ecosen was originally removed from the drafting um, from Rome and statue. And he's concerned that if it will make it this time, <laughs> what's the guarantee that you'll be able to push it that we will be able to? Okay, uh, of course, there are no absolute guarantees. However, I would say that we are living in a very different world now, in the sense that the levels of exposure of information are much, much higher because of the internet and because of the interconnectivity that we have. The levels of awareness are much higher, and the levels of public pressure, particularly on this issue, are much, much higher. And that speaks again to the last point I made with Nimo, which is about gradually creating a political space where governments will actually be embarrassed not to take this on. I mean, I don't think we're actually very far from that. When I did, perhaps not quite there yet, but I don't think it will be long before we are in that in that place. And that is what's necessary because when it comes down to it, to I mean, there's also an, there's actually one more aspect, which is that when this was being drafted, when a, when a, when a, a, a sort of treaty is originally being drafted, there is a danger that the those with the loudest voices or the most money or the most political leverage are the ones who ultimately get the say at the end. And it does look a bit like that's what probably happened in the 1990s. However, what we now have is a statute with a simple amendment procedure. And what it means is if that amendment procedure is followed, and it can be followed by any state, there's no, all states are equal at the ICC, like at the UN, and actually better than the UN, because there's no Security Council. So there's no way for a state to come in and say, no, this can't happen. It, you, effectively, if you, if you build up the, uh, you know, enough support amongst member states, you can move something forward. So, th so there's, there's, there's two or three aspects that, that are very different from the last time, which make us feel far more positive about it this time around. That's, that's good to know. Okay, so someone made a comment, which I want to turn to question to you. Um, it says, thanks for doing justice to the theme. We're closely knitted to the environment as part of the ecosystem and destroying this will destroy us too. So the person is saying, with ecocide taken as a crime, um, he said, I'm sure a clearly defined coin terms like voluntary non-fit injuria would not come, come up. So I'm asking, would this be an issue? There is a term, uh, that should be a Latin word, voluntary non-fit injuria, which means to a willing person, no injury is done. Um, would that be an issue? Let's say a community or a state is willing for extraction, which we clearly know brings much harm to the um, environment and destruction of the ecosystem. And this, the state is willing and said, okay, shall come and explore, come and um, um, violate our land, come and use our land for whatever you like. Um, to such a state, um, would, would ecocide help? What, what, what can we do? That's, that's a really interesting question, actually. Um, and I think, I mean, obviously, exactly how that pans out will depend a bit on the definition we end up with. Um, for, and, and, and obviously, the, the draft that gets proposed uh, next month. Um, but I would say that one of the things that a, a large number of the panel are, I believe, aiming for is that this crime should not be directly dependent upon either human harm, or potentially, uh, the, what, what you're talking about, which is the effectively the willingness of the victim, if you like, um, in terms of the the the, the um, because what we're what what could be possible with this crime is to create a level of ecocentricity, where what you're looking at is the harm to the environment that doesn't necessarily uh, depend upon how the humans feel about that. Um, so that's an interesting question, and I think it will depend ultimately a, a bit on the definition, but it does, I, th I think the, what, what we're so interested in doing is creating a situation where a certain level of harm to the environment is ultimately a, a criminal act. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to, as I say, we'll have to see exactly how that pans out in terms of the definition exactly. But um, but I think it will certainly improve upon the situation we currently have. That's great to know. And I agree with you that the, the definition of ecocide in the uh, international space will be, will be what will be a guiding light to whether or not um, any kind of crime or any kind of environment. So someone is asking um, how many Africans 
or, or people of African descent are directly involved in the 12 member panel, expert panel presently drafting the definition of ecocide. I believe this person is um, concerned about, um, he said, you would agree with me that in order to avoid the usual colonial detect, the aspect of the colonizing environmental and, and climate justice is of paramount interest and concern. So do we have Africans? Or Yes, we absolutely do. And I, I believe I, I know who that is. Peter, hello. You're watching. It's, it's lovely to be in a meeting with you. We haven't actually met in, in, in sort of in person on Zoom yet. Fantastic question. We have two members of the 12 person panel uh, from Africa. We have uh, someone from Sierra Leone and someone from Senegal. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I think we have just one more question before we um, end this now. Okay, you earlier mentioned that. Um, um, for countries who have not ratified um, uh, the crime, or the yeah, who have not ratified the law yet, that um, take for instance Belgium, who has could um, um, hold someone, maybe a United American person account for a crime done in Belgium. So I'm wondering, maybe this would be closely linked to the last question. What if um, America, who is not, um, who is who has not bought into this, um, commits a crime of ecocide in their own land? How would we hold such people accountable? How would eco settles the law for such people? That's probably the that's one of the instances where it would be difficult for ecocide law to uh, to be used. If somebody is committing ecocide in their own country and they're not a member and they haven't signed up to this crime or whatever, then that obviously is very difficult for the crime to reach. What it could do, however, I mean, the, the only the possibility I can see for that. Which, which is it's not impossible and it has happened, is by applying universal jurisdiction, you can actually arrest somebody for a crime. So long as the crime is in existence, you can arrest somebody for that crime so long as they're on your territory. So the, the obvious example of that was when General Pinochet uh, from Chile was arrested in the UK in 1998 under these provisions. And he said, well, look, Chile's not signed up. Um, to I think it was it was it was um, crimes against humanity that he was arrested for, and he and his objection was that Chile was not signed up to that. Um, but the UK Supreme Court decided that that didn't matter. He had set foot on UK soil, and the UK had signed up to that law, and therefore the UK could arrest and detain him. So. You know, so, so that's an example of exactly that, of somebody committing crimes in their own country, which is not subject to that law. But if they then travel to a country which is subject to that law, under the principles of universal jurisdiction, it is possible to make arrests. Well, that is great. Sorry I said that that was the last question. Just one more <laughs> before we go. It looks like this is a very interesting topic. And I, I like Nemo said, uh, we should not just end this year. Maybe we should have um, conversations on Ecoside 2.0 very soon. <laughs> we'll reach out to you. Okay, so um, you earlier mentioned that um, um, the people, the, the states would have, maybe local communities would have a role to play in getting the state or a country to ratify the law of. So I'm wondering, what would you advise people to do? What would you advise in, um, interested individuals like the ones on this um, meeting right now to do to the um, concept of um, get, getting equal side recognized? Do you advise um, individuals, interested individuals like us on this platform to do? Um, I know you had mentioned, would there be another thing that you want us to do to help push this concept? Uh, absolutely, um, absolutely. I think, I think, I think the the um, the obvious one is that, in fact, when when people say what can we do in our country, we always suggest that there are three potential things that people can do. One is obviously to sign up to the campaign and to help support the campaign um, and to encourage others to do so. That's one thing. Um, the second is the conversational aspect that, that was talking about, just, just you know, broadening the conversation. The third one, which is ultimately the goal of what we're doing, is the political traction. So communicating with your elected representatives and making sure that they are aware of this concept 
that and of the advantages of it um and you know the, of the fact that they could you know they could support ecocide as an international crime without any immediate political risk but they can then have the kudos of being a leader in the environmental space by pledging their support to this um, and effectively you know keeping that conversation alive you know um, at, on the political level with your political representatives that would be the the, the next most obvious thing to do yeah this is beautiful thank you so much and um I don't know if I would not be biased. Someone just asked them, um, when ecocide is put into law, will it be an international original crime? And what I could already answer that we're fighting for it to be recognized as an international crime. The question I may not be able to answer is, what happens if a country fails to sign it into law? That's the last question I think I will have to you. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the likelihood is that not every country or not every member state of the ICC will immediately sign this into law. But we do believe that over time there will be an accumulation of signatures, as, as often happens with treaties. We imagine that, that there will be a certain number of countries that will sign up to it from the beginning. And at the moment, it looks like the um, small uh, island developing states, as well as European states, seem to be at the forefront of that. But we fully believe that over time, more and more countries will sign up to this. We really do feel it's not a question of if this happens, it's a question of when. And in fact, my dear late friend Polly Higgins um, when she was still around she had a conversation a few years ago with um, a big insurer in fact I think it was a reinsurer the people who insure the insurers and they told her at that time which I believe was 2012 or 2013 they actually said to her we know something like this is coming we just don't know when so it's just a question of accumulating that support because with the situation we have globally environmentally you know, like I say, we don't necessarily think this will fix ed everything, but without a, a rule like this in place, it's very difficult to see how we're really going to make it as a civilization. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's like a kind of necessary but not sufficient element. Um, so we fully believe that uh, while everybody may not ratify straight away, there are, of course, ways of, 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 of uh, pursuing this law in other countries that have ratified, and we believe over time, the whole world will ultimately get on board because if we want to still be living in this world, we need to be protecting it. Thank you so much, uh, you've, uh You've opened up the discussion very uh, broadly and also as well as specifically. A lot of questions have been answered in the hearts of participants and I'm sure more would have or some would have other questions forthcoming. Uh, I want to recommend that if you have questions that you couldn't post right now, you can always send them to us and we'll pass it on. You can also sign up, go to the website stopecocide.x and sign up uh, so that you'll be getting updates about what is going on. Uh, that would be very useful. Jojo, we cannot say thank you enough. In a, a Chino Achebe, the great Nigerian writer said, the best way to thank anyone is to say thank you, thank you, and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's been fantastic to be here. Yes, thanks a lot. And to all our comrades, we'll be having uh, a special lecture tomorrow, right? Life Who Lecture uh, at 4 p.m. Nigerian time. Uh, the link for registration is right there in the chat box. We're having a top notch uh, pract uh, practitioner in the field of agriculture, Dr. Hens. Hans Haren speaking to us on the topic, Africa can feed herself. You're going to hear that we, how, why we don't need GMOs, why we don't need all those kind of crazy stuff and really get to know what needs to be done. Then with regard to conversations, uh, the next two upcoming conversation will be, one will be a conversation with Franz Fanon. I'm sure you all know Franz Fanon, the writer of The Wretched of the Earth. It's one of the required texts that everyone in Home F must read every, regularly. And so we're going to have a conversation with him, uh, with his ideas, and then we'll also be having another one on African technological assessment. We have, uh, we have in home of the Africa, African technology assessment, trying to make sense of new technologies emerging in the world, uh, because a lot of this is not being integrated, uh, interrogated. Uh, you can reach us directly for more information on that. 
or you can reach you can reach funny so directly she's the one in charge of that i can see light bulbs go up on her head with technology every time so <laughs> so thank you thank you very much thank you all for joining us uh on, unfortunately this way we have to call it a day thank you and have a beautiful day thank you thank you everyone join us tomorrow see you thank you maybe you can you switch on your video that we can take some photos together as well Put on your video for a moment we'll take some yes please can we just <laughs> yes for a group, a, a group um, photo yes okay. a group online photo oh uh, yes uh, my goodness look at everybody uh this is beautiful so I'm very serious to have everyone yes okay. thank you okay. thank you very much bye bye Thank you. Bye-bye.